Nurse here. And today we're gonna to be talking about this pistol, which if you didn't gather from the title and that shooting intro, is the Generation 4 Glock 34 Practical Tactical Competition Pistol. Now, before we get too far into this pistol, I do want to throw out a little bit of a disclaimer and talk about the nature of my relationship with Glock. I do not have a relationship with Glock. At best, I am that dude that stalks their Facebook and likes pictures from like three years ago. They don't even know I exist. And it's important to say because I consider myself kind of a uh, OG Glock fanboy. I've been a fan of Glock ever since I was 12 years old. Uh, I saw the movie U.S. Marshals with Tommy Lee Jones, and he was just running around talking about how great the Glock was and had a couple of memorable quotes from uh, about Glocks. One or two of them might have made it onto my you know, Facebook quotes section when I was a kid. Oh, God, I hope I deleted those. I'm going to have to check that later. But anyway, um, I've, I've been a longtime fan of what... Glock has called perfection, and I'm not too far from believing that is what this pistol is. It's especially this one specifically, which we'll get into here in just a little bit. Now, in order to be able to talk about the 34, we do need to delve into a little bit of history as to where this pistol came from, and that is the Glock 17L. So, mid 80s, uh, Glock safe action pistols start making their way into the US in the form of the Glock 17, which was the only pistol that Glock had out at the time. And they kind of they kind of caused a stir in the American market because once again we were kind of stuck in the old ways where we wanted steel, you know, either heavy carbon steel or heavy stainless steel or something like that. We were we were big fans of hammer fire and steel guns. What's going on with these Tupperware pistols, as they referred to them at the time? So, hi, Brad. So there was a lot of pushback from the American shooter when it came to these pistols, which is kind of unfortunate because they really are fantastic pistols. Now, law enforcement and many other people saw to it that the Glock got its due time for popularity. Now, not too long after the 17 came out, the 17L came on the scene. The 17L, as you can kind of imply by its name, is a longer barreled Glock 17. So the 17L is a six inch barreled Glock 17, still everything else the same, standard capacity, standard function, all that kind of stuff, just a, a six inch long barrel. And this pistol took an immediate chunk out of the competition market because you had a long barreled nine millimeter with a 17 round capacity. And that long barrel not only gave it higher velocity and greater sight radius and all that kind of stuff, but it also really decreased the recoil of the pistol. Now, nine millimeter, even in a Glock, is not a terribly heavy recoiling bullet to begin with. However, when you still add in a little bit more weight, and especially that front forward weight that a heavy barrel provides and slide, that really helps the gun track smoothly and uh, flat and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't really have a lot of muzzle rise and recoil. So it's really easy for it to keep on target. Pair that with the fact that even though Glock, especially generation one and two pistols, are not exactly renowned for having fantastic triggers, the 17L came standard with a lighter trigger pull. So it's more or less an out of the box, ready to go competition pistol, especially in a time when there wasn't a thriving Glock aftermarket like we have now. However, when you consider that the competition uh, on the competitive circuit, we're running a lot of 1911s or in the high capacity options, either Smith & Wesson third generation pistols or say Beretta Model 92s and stuff like that, this pistol was really stomping them pretty good. And I think that rankled a lot of people. And it kind of caused a rule shift. Now, I think that that was two part. One, there was a lot of people who really resented that the polymer gum was coming in and it was kicking the crap out of all of the American products or, or even the accepted foreign products like the Beretta. You know, so it's 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 beating the all steel guns and it's beating them pretty soundly to where a guy can pretty much just walk off the street and be competitive in competition. So that that had a lot of people kind of chafing right off the bat. And then I also think from the people who changed the rules in the matches, I think they did so because you kind of lose some competitive spirit when just anybody can come in and perform well. Now, of course, it's more inclusive if anybody can come in and perform well, but 
you know, what's the point in even trying if a guy shows up with a 17L and you're sitting there with a, a 38 Super 1911 and a single stack magazine? Like, where, well, where's the fun in that? So how do they change the rules? So there's a box that a lot of competitions have that your pistol needs to be able to fit into in order to be able to compete in the uh, stock circuit or the carry circuit, and however it is that they, they break down their circuits, but more or less the bare bones gun, the out of the box gun. And they shortened it just a little bit so as to preclude the 17L from fitting in it. Well now it goes more into like a limited or unlimited category where it's facing against race guns, purpose built, purpose tuned comp competition pistols. And again, when we're at a time when Glock doesn't have the vibrant uh, aftermarket that it does now, it's pretty difficult for an out-of-the-box pistol to compete at that level. So that kind of um, kind of sound the death knell for the 17L. Uh, I know that Glock still produces some. They produce them in very limited runs every couple of years, and it seems that they still produce them in the Gen 3. It hasn't really moved past the Gen 3 in production. But for the most part, they don't, they don't make a lot of them. You don't see very many of them out there. You run into them occasionally. There's also a 40 caliber variant called the Glock 24. Same, same slide length and all that kind of stuff, just in 40 caliber. And you also don't see those very often. And they also come out in very limited runs. But for the most part, they, they kind of, as soon as the rules changed, that kind of killed that pistol. But that was okay, because Glock had a solution for that. And that was this gun. So what Glock did was they shortened this pistol just enough to be able to fit into that box that the competition circuits shrank. So this is a 5.3 inch barrel. It's right in there with the 1911 and you get 1911-esque sight radius and velocities, well, in the nine millimeter at least. And there's also a 40 caliber variant of this as well, the Glock 35. A lot of the technical data that we talk about will cover both of those guns. So you saw these, the 34s in a Gen 3, and then this one specifically is a Gen 4. We'll talk about a lot of the differences across the generations as I come to features on the gun that cover that. So, this gun is what they used, is what they brought in to replace the 17L, and it has been very, very prevalent on the competition circuits. Every pistol competition I've won I've gone to has had at least 134, if not more, at the competition. So you can definitely say that they are popular. Let's go ahead and talk about some features. Right off the bat, we have the Glock factory sights on this particular pistol. They are made of plastic and are definitely a source of contention for a lot of people when it comes to Glock pistols. I will tell you quickly that I think they are perfectly manageable to get you out to the range. However, we're gonna expand a little bit more about my experiences with the gun and these sights specifically here after a little bit. You also see that there's a notch cut into the slide that is to be able to reduce the weight of the slide to make sure that you have uh, prime function across multiple calibers and conditions and all that kind of stuff. The 17L, from what I've seen, so I've, I've interacted with two 17Ls. One guy said that his 17L did not like Stabilize or did not like functioning with anything below 124 grain bullets. The other 17L that I've interacted with ran everything just fine, though it is much older than the first 17L I interacted with. Maybe that's the point, maybe that's what it is, just the spring needed some time to break in. I don't know, I just know that some of them do seem to be ammo finicky, whereas this Glock 34 has not hiccuped with anything that I put in it yet. Go ahead and take down. Like I mentioned before, we have a 5.3 inch barrel and this weighs 25 ounces unloaded. Glock uses polyagonal rifling in their barrels, which is pretty fantastic as far as getting a good seal against the bullet with no possible gas leakage when it comes to getting the most velocity and accuracy out of a barrel. But it does mean that this gun does not like to run lead bullets. Uh, you'll wind up with either too much pressure right off the bat or as successive rounds pass down the bore and they leave leading behind or lead material behind the barrel, you will, you could eventually come up with a overpressure type scenario in your barrel. Now in addition to that, Glock chambers are not fully supported. You see the support is just in a couple of areas. And when it comes to factory ammunition, this is not a big deal. This is not something that I would consider to be a deal breaker on any Glock pistol 
to begin with. However, if you're doing a lot of reloads and you're looking to make some real barn burners of reloaded bullets to put into your Glocks, that might be something you want to consider. I've only ever known I've only ever known personally one guy who's blown up a Glock. I've seen a lot of pictures on the internet and all that kind of stuff. And that fellow who blew up a Glock blew up a Gen 4 19 because he switched over from loading for 40 Smith & Wesson to 9mm. He changed out his dies and everything, but he didn't change out his powder charge. And first round he put through the gun, blew the slide apart. I, at least he wasn't injured. Well, nothing but his pride at least. Now, something else that is indicative in the Gen 4s is the double captive recoil spring. You first saw this in the subcompact Glocks, the 26, the 27, and it's many other variants that came out with the Gen 3 pistols. And now it has become a standard feature in Gen 4 and Gen 5 Glock pistols. Now, moving from there, we do have a Glock proprietary rail on the dust cover here, which pretty much became standard with the Gen 3s. We have a textured and squared off trigger guard here, which again is indicative of an older style of shooting that had people grabbing the front of the trigger guard to help cement in their grip. I don't see people just default to grabbing the trigger guard as much anymore, as much as I see a hybrid between thumbs forward and then just a little bit of extra oomph grabbing the front of that trigger guard. To each their own, if it works for you, it works for you. The Glock long slide pistols come with improved triggers. Now, Glock will tell you that their stock trigger is about 5.5 pounds, and I consider that to be a very conservative estimate. It's a, they feel more to me like the six to six and a half range. The box on these guns will tell you that they come in at about four and a half pounds, and I, again, think that's a little conservative and it's more like five to 5.5 pounds. Regardless, it is a lighter trigger. Now, I'll save my trigger comments until we also talk about the sights. There's, there's a couple of upgrades and stuff like that that I have very strong opinions on, and I wanna make sure that we discuss those later. Finger groups. A lot of people have some very polarized opinions on finger grooves. I am not bothered by finger grooves. That was a feature that was introduced in the Gen 3s and continued in the Gen 4s but dropped in the Gen 5s. Now, a lot of people complain about finger grooves because their fingers fall on top of the grooves, and I can understand that. I can see that being annoying, and I can see why you wouldn't like that. I don't have that problem. However, based on logic, if I have no problem with the finger grooves being there, I also don't have a problem with the finger grooves being gone. So, take that for what you will. The Glock frame on the Gen 4s has this rough texture, which is supposed to be very grippy. It is, but some people find it not to be grippy enough. We'll talk about that more here in a little bit. The Glock comes standard with a 17 round magazine, and it can hold any of the magazines that hold more than 17 rounds. So all the way out to the 33 round magazines available for Glock, and the aftermarket options similar to that as well. You can get drum magazines for these. They are a polymer outer shell with a steel reinforced uh, sleeve inside. You can also get extended base plates, all that kind of stuff. There's, there's a thriving aftermarket for these pistols. The Gen 4 also went to a large and reversible magazine release. It's very spacious. I actually really can't stand the Gen 3 and earlier mag releases. I found them to be very small. You'll see a lot of people cut out a little dish behind them so that you can reach it more easily, but, or you'll see them go with the extended competition version. I've got to say, I'm not a fan of the extended competition version. I was once shooting a Glock 17 Gen 3 with the extended magazine release, and my grip at the time wound up functioning the magazine release after I fired like one round and I had an embarrassing moment when I had a click, no bang, and the magazine was sitting at my feet. So I guess I've just never really recovered from that. The long slides come standard with an extended slide release, which surprisingly, that little ear on there, you don't think it's that much, but really, it completely changes that slide release. It, it actually really helps out a lot and I, if I was a person that ran slide releases, I would find this really advantageous. You can add these to any model of Glock that you would like. Uh, as I've told you guys before, I prefer to overhand rack on my slides. It just, it works better across a wide variety of 
weapon systems, different manufacturers, different models and all that kind of stuff if I just standardized to one gross movement to be able to function my pistols. Now also something that was introduced first to the Gen 4s and has been continued into the Gen 5s is the removable back straps. Glock comes with a variety of back straps. Uh, you can take them off and run the small or then you can add a medium and large. This is actually the medium beaver tail. They do have a large beaver tail as well and then non beaver tail options of course. When I bought my Glock 23 in 2012 they did not have the extended beaver tail options or at least mine didn't come with it and uh, I, I was very disappointed by that because once I discovered these I was like man this is really great and I really wish my 23 had one but I eventually found one just lying around. The back strap and the front straps on the Glock are texturized in the same manner that the side panels are. I find it grippy. I've never had any issues with gripping the gun but it seems that some people do. As with most European manufacturers pistols this does have a lanyard loop. I have never seen anybody attach a lanyard to a Glock. Not even sure why it is still there. Let me check my notes real quick, but I think that, uh, yeah, pretty much covers this pistol. Now, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about my experience with the gun. So I have taken this to a shooting course, and then I also shot like a pickup round at a competition that I, I recently entered into. I didn't actually wind up competing with the gun. It was more as the end of the day I had this as an additional gun with me in case my primary gun went down and I decided to go ahead and shoot a couple of the the courses of fire not for credit with this gun. And then in addition to that I have, I have quite a few rounds through it and all that kind of stuff doing you know just training at the range. And there's a couple things that I found about this gun when it comes to certain aftermarket modifications you see people like to tout that might for the first time have some credibility to me. And it starts off with these sights. Now for a long time I was a huge proponent of standard Glock sights as something that are perfectly manageable to get the average person by on their day to day. They're workable, they line up, they do what they're supposed to do, all that kind of stuff. But you know if you were a cop or something like that and it was going to be coming in and out of the holster all the time these polymer sights will get beat up, they will start to deform. Maybe that's a time that you should consider you know, if you're doing heavy duty use with this gun, maybe you should consider getting some type of metal sights to go with it. And I believed all this very fervently until I shot a pistol course with it a while back. And we were doing one-handed manipulations, both reloads and malfunction clearance. And for the first time ever, I had to wrench on this rear sight with my belt or the back of my boot. And that was the first time I ever questioned how well these sights would hold up. And suddenly, I had to kind of change my mind on where replacing the iron sights on a Glock sat in my priority list. It's now the first thing I'm going to do with Glock pistols once I get around to making modifications to this gun. Those sights are going away right off the bat. I had never had a point so eloquently proven to me as when the first time I went to rack this thing off my heel. Now that that immediate gut check that I had right right there in my stomach, like ooh, I may come away with out an, without a rear sight. I should work on this. So now, replacing the iron sights is literally the first thing I'm going to upgrade about this pistol. Now keep in mind, I've got a lot of projects going on at any one time. I've got one that is taking so much of my time right now, but I cannot wait to get in front of the camera. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but it's going to be fun. So, I mean, I shot that pistol course three months ago, and I still have the original stock sights on this, so you can kind of tell still where upgrading pistol sights sits in my continuum of concern, I guess you could say. Now, triggers. Now, a lot of people do not like Glock stock triggers. This is something I still hold firm on. These pistols shoot just fine. Their triggers are just fine for out-of-the-box guns especially when you're talking about the slightly improved trigger on the Practical Tactical series. The vast majority of people confuse a not competition-ready trigger with their shooting ability. 
So everyone sits there and they go to the range and they shoot the gun and it's not that their fundamentals are terrible or they need to work on shooting, it's that the gun is wrong. The gun needs some work. I'm gonna tell you right now, this gun, as long as you do your part, works great and it will give you way better accuracy than what the vast majority of shooters out there can actually ring out of it. I think it's way more important to evaluate your own skill level as opposed to blame the equipment. This is an anime. It doesn't do anything it wasn't already designed to do. This gun was designed to run straight out of the box. So if you can't run it straight out of the box, I'm gonna guess it's not the gun. Now if you're you know, a heavy trainer and a, a, a heavy competition shooter and all that kind of stuff, yeah, I, I understand you wanting to swap out your trigger, but that's also because you've put in the time and you can actually recognize the differences that a trigger makes and how it is that you work around a handgun. And that makes sense to me. But your average Joe picks one of these up and immediately drops a three and a half pound connector and, and you know, a crazy trigger in it and all this kind of stuff. I kind of just shake my head. You've got to invest time in your guns, guys. You've got to put in the effort. You've got to spend the bullets, the time, and the money in order to be able to learn where the gun drops off and you pick up and vice versa. All right, I'm going to get off my soapbox about that one. Now, the texturing and the finger grooves. What you'll see a lot of people do on the Gen 3s and Gen 4s is you will see them uh, do a lot of sanding and a lot of stipling with a Dremel. Or not a Dremel. Well, sanding with a Dremel. But uh, a lot of stipling with a... Uh, Soldering iron. I was, gonna, I was about to say burny thing with a tip. Soldering iron. And that's all well and good to each their own. At this point, I have never found, like I say, I'm not bothered by finger grooves, so I'm not in a big hurry to delete them. And I'm not bothered by this texture. I haven't ever lost control of the gun in any conditions that I've been working in, so I don't really feel like I need additional stipling. It is something that I do want to run this gun more and my other Glocks and really evaluate whether or not stipling would be helpful to me. Also, if anyone out there has a gun that is stipled and they want to let me take it through a course or a competition or something like that, I'm, I'm open to the idea. Just, just saying. Now, you also see a lot of people talk about trying to get an undercut on this trigger guard so they can get a higher grip on the gun. I could see that because I do sometimes feel like I'm coming in just a little short on being able to fully choke up on this pistol, but I also know that playing around a little bit with the back straps might help me with that. I really like this beaver tail back strap a lot, so I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of choke in order to get something else to flex against my hand to kind of help keep this barrel tracking straight. So with having said that, we already saw the intro, but how else did it shoot? Let me go ahead and roll in just a little bit more range footage from that day. All right, well that was pretty good footage, right? But I did miss that one shot. I'm telling you guys right now, it takes a lot of time and effort to get these videos together and it also takes really good timing so once again I shoot at a public range there's other people there so I've got to get there super early in the morning and get there before anyone else starts shooting or it's gonna ruin my footage so I'm kinda of pressed for time and ultimately you guys are gonna kinda of get what you get which is to say sometimes I'm on sometimes I'm not sometimes I miss a thin steel bottle silhouette just barely and have to come back up and pick it up I'm no expert I'm just like everybody else, so we get what we get. Now, what role does this pistol hold for me? That's what I'm trying to decide right now. Now, obviously the gun is billed as a uh, competition pistol, and in that way, this would do fantastic. When I shot those two you know, practice courses of fire the other weekend, I noticed that I probably easily cut my time in my raw time by about 40 percent and also shot cleaner overall and i i really put it on my interaction with this pistol this gun just feels like an extension of my arm i i really work with this gun very very well and it has become one of my favorite pistols in my collection and because of that it also makes me wonder how this would hold up in defensive situations which is why i took it to that uh, pistol course that I shot 
And the only real issue is, is that this is entirely too long for concealed carry. This is more of an, an open carry or duty type weapon, which some police departments have adopted this and the 40 caliber variant, also the 45, the Glock 41. The 45 caliber long slide has also been adopted by some police agencies. And I think that's really cool, that's awesome. I could see this being a great duty sized gun. And that's where I, I find myself kind of struggling. Do I, do I outfit this gun as a competition gun and try to burn up the competition circuit with it? Do I mill out the slide, pop a red dot on it, and you know maybe get some porting done or something like that? Or do I upgrade to some combat sights, maybe still keep the red dot, throw a light on it, and try to use it as a, a duty pistol? Well. I can't really use it as a duty pistol, but, but use it with as a defensive pistol in mindset. And that's kind of at the crossroads that I'm at now and trying to decide how to move forward. But I'll tell you what, guys, as you watch this and you evaluate the information and the shooting footage that I put into this video, why don't you leave a comment on what it is that you think I should try to get away with on this pistol. Modifications to guns are such a tricky thing to me, especially when we talk about stipling and milling, because I really like the stock look of this pistol it just looks looks tough it looks cool it's you feel like uh denzel washington in that uh that movie what movie did he do oh man that's gonna bug me it'll come to me later i'll just i'll just randomly throw it in the comments or something like that man on man apart man on fire man on fire yeah it was man on fire yeah makes me think of denzel washington and man on fire which was a fantastic movie if you haven't seen it but Well, guys, I think that's pretty much what I've got when it comes to this pistol. It's one of my most favorite pistols in the collection. It's been a fantastic weapon in anything that I've applied it in so far. It's actually my wife's bedside gun. So, with that being the case, I'm going to send us out on a last little bit of range footage, watching this gun track across multiple targets and apply it in some practical type senses. And uh, you guys have a good day.